Hi everyone and welcome to another uh, fireside chat at Avana Climate Corner. Uh, today we have with us Kelly Ahar, the co-founder and president of Vesta, uh, an ocean-based carbon dioxide removal company. Kelly has a multidisciplinary background and is committed to reframing complex issues into scalable holistic solutions. She has commercialized sustainable technologies, um, provided strategic direction to multi-stakeholder initiatives, uh, managed disaster relief projects, produced large-scale international events, and consulted for climate change mitigation projects. Um, Vesta is a public benefit co uh, company which designs, executes, and measures carbon removal projects based on its nature-based solution known as coastal carbon capture. This works by deploying olivine sand in coastal areas and wetlands, accelerating the Earth's natural long-term process of rock weathering to reduce ocean acidity and remove carbon dioxide. Uh, Kelly will talk more about Vesta's technology and why it, uh, it holds so much promise. Uh, hi, Kelly. Uh, welcome to Havana Climate Corner. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So Kelly, you had quite a fascinating journey with several years working on a multitude of solutions for climate and sustainability. Uh, would love to hear more about what ignited this interest and how did Vesta happen? Oh yeah. Um, so originally I studied biology. Um, I've always been I've always been an environmentalist and interested in how humans can positively interact with the natural world um, and ways that we can intervene that are beneficial um, to the natural world. And so that's looked um, as 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 you mentioned in the intro, that's looked like a number of different things throughout my career. Um, and originally I, I worked more in the sustainability space, um, sort of in more of the terms of sustainability that, that many of us work in, um, sort of in the ESG space. And then in, um, in a, on a solution for actually a waterless toilet, I, that was my first company, I was a waterless toilet company that decomposed waste, uh, waste very rapidly and provided a liquid fertilizer um, as the output. And then I moved from working on, on more of the sustainability side of things to working on carbon dioxide removal technologies about six years ago, um, having realized that we were, we as a society are falling really behind on our climate goals. Um, and as scientific consensus built towards understanding that we don't any we do not live in a world where reducing emissions is is going to be enough anymore to meet our climate goals we have to do really large scale carbon removal i wanted to turn my attention to focus on that and so since then i've worked on a couple of different technologies i started my career working on a commercialization strategy for direct air capture um, and then moved into a more uh, soil based approach uh, in a regenerative ag agriculture op uh, application um, and I started Vesta back in 2019 after doing a broad suite of research, trying to understand where there were um, solutions that had really untapped potential for large scale carbon removal um, and, and that could provide carbon removal at a, in a way that is cost effective and very scalable. Um, and I came around to the, the core sort of technology behind what we do in academic literature. Um, and so there there had been about 30 years of academic support behind the solution uh, behind coastal carbon capture, which is known in, in academia as coastal enhanced weathering. Um, and all the, of the sort of papers were pointing to real life field trials being the clear next step to test uh, to test this solution and and men uh, validate it as a as a really large scale climate solution, but no one had ever made it out of the lab, even after three, three decades or more of um, support for the solution type. And so my co founders and I uh, really wanted to see if we could make that happen. So we started Vesta back in 2019. Um, in 2020, we talked to uh, an, a, a leading expert in the space and they said, yes, this is really interesting, but it's going to take a decade or more to get a field trial live. It's just too hard. There's too many stakeholders that need to be involved. It's, it's scientifically very difficult. Uh, but after two years of operations last year, we launched uh, not one, but two uh, field pilots. So we're really excited to now be generating the first ever field data on this solution. And it's, uh, it's incredibly positive. Uh, can you help us understand the overall carbon capture landscape from a technology's uh, lens? And how would you look at these various technologies from a scalability angle? Uh, would they be, for example, deployment ready? What would it cost? 
Yeah, so there's many ways to do carbon dioxide removal, right? When we're talking about carbon dioxide removal or, or CDR as, as the helpful acronym, um, we're really just talking about capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and locking it away, away for a period of you know decades or years um, to even centuries and doing so in plants and soils or doing so in the ocean um, or geological features or even in products. Um, so there's many ways to do this. Um, and today, many of them are being are being posed for really large scale impact. Um, I think there are costs and, and benefits to each type, right? So with afforestation or reforestation, we're planting really big new forests uh, that have the potential for, for scalable uh, carbon removal today. But ultimately, the carbon removal that we're doing in forests is going to be um, impermanent. So that means that we're doing temporary removals. Um, the trees and the plants grow and absorb carbon dioxide, but they're, when they die, they will re-release that carbon dioxide. So we're talking about storage on the order of decades. Um, it's still great. But when we're thinking about the, the climate problem, it's one that is going to last, um, carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere today is going to last hundreds of years and in, in, in some cases, even thousands of years. And so it's important that we think about permanent solutions. Um, so we're not just kicking the can down the road. Um, there's of course also soil carbon sequestration where you can use different agricultural practices and increase the amount of carbon that's stored in soils also great um, and really helpful when integrating with local communities and practices that are already underway and providing some additional support to to the nature uh, uh, to the idea of you know better yields and things like that but again we, there's a a lack of permanence and increase the permanence um, you know on the order again of decades and then we have biochar creating kind of charcoal and, and burying it or plowing it into fields, which is another great nature based um, solution, but can again hit the can uh, sort of hit scalability barriers um, in some ways and um, right now there's there's a lot of movement in the biochar space we're seeing new methodologies for measurement coming online um, it's it's getting a lot of attention um, I think there are still some kind of questions around the ultimate scalability of biochar just given the amount of bio biomass that would be needed uh, but it's a, it's a promising solution um, there's bioenergy with carbon capture and storage um, or, or BEX as it's as it's sort of um, acronymed to be, where we capture and sequester carbon um, from biofuels and, and bioenergy plants, uh, which again is really exciting. Uh, one of the main barriers to to scale there is again biomass that would be required to to do this at scale. Let's get this to gigaton or, or billion ton um, levels of uh, removals. It would require a lot of land mass to to grow the necessary um, biomass. And then we have this field of uh, enhanced rock weathering or enhanced mineralization where we spread crushed rocks over, over land or into the ocean um, to absorb carbon dioxide uh, or, or, or within the world of mineralization, you know, using these uh, minerals that can, can um, be exposed to carbon dioxide rich fluids or the air to, to mineralize more quickly. Um, so there we're, we're talking about everything from, you know, what Kind of what we do to even mineralization can extend to um, uh, what you know the company called Heirloom does, um, creating kind of more limestone. And then there's direct air capture, uh, which gets a lot of which gets a lot of attention these days. Building these machines that could suck carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere and either make um, value added products with it or bury it um, or you know inject it into into the ground. Um, so direct air capture, again, really interesting. I think one of the, the, the main concerns there are, um, are cost. Uh, so direct air capture is, is currently very expensive to do on a ton by ton basis. Uh, we're talking about a thousand to $2,000 per ton of removal. And there are many companies that have incredibly ambitious goals for how cheap it could get. Um, but there are some, some serious um, scaling limits there. Um, you know, we're still talking about the hundreds of dollars of, of, room, of uh, cost per ton with direct air capture. Um, and the other component of direct air capture that's, that's a limit is the energy intensity. So uh, roughly 1,000 to 2,000 kilowatt hours 
uh, per ton of carbon removal. And, um, you know, ultimately, if we're going to power direct air capture to continue to be net negative, it needs to be powered by renewable energy technologies, which, of course, is a scarce resource. Um, so that and then um, some of the sort of industrial requirements as well to build direct air capture plants are of, of concern. Um, but I think it's it's a, a solution that many are excited about, especially because of the opportunity for value added products um, and the ability to work within the existing sort of oil and gas industry, um, abandoned infrastructure and things like that. Um, and then on the back of direct air capture, point source, air, uh, point source capture, putting you know carbon capture facilities directly onto flu stacks. And then there's a whole world of ocean-based methods um, from blue carbon in um, salt marshes and seagrasses and uh, mangroves, which is akin to afforestation and reforestation, but in the ocean, um, to ocean alkalinity enhancement, where you either spread alkaline minerals um, in the ocean like what we do, or you inject alkalinity directly through... Uh, a chemical process, um, different ways to work with um, the the natural nutrient flows of the ocean um, to to try and advance carbon removal. Which um, some of those those techniques are a little bit more contentious um, based on some projects that happened uh, a few decades ago. But um, that's sort of the overall suite of technologies. Again, they all have their costs and benefits, and they're at different levels of maturity, which means that. Um, they they have different um, different things to pioneer, right? So um, within the direct air capture space, a lot of a lot of, there's a lot more technical advancement needed to get beyond small scale to, to large scale. So different physical problems um, as you move from a four thousand ton plant to a hundred thousand ton plant to a million ton plant. Um, methods like ours are, um, because we're doing the first ever field sites, we're generating the first field data, which is being, um, which is, which is really to say that we are pioneering methods for, for measuring this process in the ocean. Um, so one of the big concerns in the carbon removal space is how do you directly measure the carbon removal process and prove that uh, your process is in fact, removing carbon from the atmosphere, not having any adverse effects, um, and that on a net basis. It's, it's, it's a positive, it's creating positive claim, um, is really critical to, to being able to have a sustainable business model and, uh, and kind of build the market on that, on that basis. So um, I'll stop there with the sort of broad overview. That's, that's extremely uh, helpful. Um, and you said that Vesta uses uh, coastal carbon capture. Uh, can you tell us more about the technology and uh, why that holds so much promise? Yeah, so coastal carbon capture um, is ultimately accelerating the Earth's natural long-term carbon cycle. So when I spoke about afforestation and reforestation, that's working with the short-term carbon cycle, the process um, that happens quickly on Earth, where carbon is absorbed into plants and then re-released when they die. Uh, but the long-term carbon cycle is actually what regulates carbon levels on Earth um, and does so over millennia and is really uh, what's responsible for the 99.9% the .9 of all carbon on Earth being stored in rocks. Um, and this process occurs through a series of natural chemical reactions that happen between the atmosphere, alkaline minerals um, and rocks, and uh, the ocean. And so what happens here is uh, when rain falls on alkaline rocks, uh, they, the, the rocks are atmosphere and enter into groundwater as bicarbonate. Um, so this chemical reaction occurs and then as the water moves into the ocean, it transforms into calcium carbonate and can be used by marine organisms to build their skeletons and shells and eventually turns back into limestone. Uh, so this is the low carbon cycle. And at Vesta with coastal carbon capture, we're accelerating not that entire cycle, but the carbon removal part of that process. So we take olivine, which is an abundant natural mineral. It's found on every continent, uh, actually makes up over 50% of the upper mantle. We grind it into a sand, and then we add that sand into coastal areas, so coastlines and salt marshes. And when it dissolves in seawater, 
it removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by generating new alkalinity in the ocean. Um, and so that is the process by which we can flux carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in the ocean in a way that is safe and permanent. Um, so currently the ocean absorbs a lot of carbon as, as um, carbonic acid acid. So our oceans have become very acidic since the industrial revolution. And so when we add alkalinity, we're essentially increasing the ocean's buffer capacity to continue sequestering and storing carbon dioxide. And there's a few really great uh, advantages to this approach. It's highly permanent. So um, on the order of 100,000 years or more of, of storage in the ocean, um, we are able to do so in a very scalable way. Um, so there's trillions of tons of olivine on, on Earth. So there's plenty of the material and it would only take a very small amount of coastline to get to billion ton removal scale. Um, so we're talking about a billion tons or more of removals a year. And the ultimate cost is very, very effective. So roughly $21 per ton at scale with um, extreme energy and, and life cycle efficiency here. And then, of course, there's co-benefits associated with it related to, uh, you know, reducing ocean acidity locally and also helping to support coastal communities and ecosystems that are currently suffering from sea level rise and erosion. Um, so by collaborating with, with them, we can add this sand to eroding coastal systems to help with coastal resilience efforts, um, which is exactly how we've brought the solution um, into the world today. So uh, there have been some segments that have raised concerns about further interference with environmental systems, uh, particularly when it comes to using oceans for sequestration. Uh, how would you look at uh, potential environmental side effects from accelerated weathering and uh, increased uh, ocean alkalinity, uh, especially since field trials are uh, you know yet to begin? Yeah. Um, so I guess the one added on that um, is that. At this point, we have we have done field trials of ocean alkalinity enhancement. They are the first ones, and we're and we're just publishing the first data um, from these sites. But um, but they have they have just begun as of last year, so it's exciting. Um, so of course, you know, whenever we're intervening in the natural system, we want to be sure that we're not causing harm where we thought we would be creating um, benefit. And so, ecological safety is one of the core. Um, components of our research program. So since 2019, that's been one of our largest questions that we've been studying in the lab um, and now in, um, in the real world, in the field. Um, related to, so when we're talking about ocean-based removal, um, there's, there's very different environmental concerns depending on the solution. Um, so VESTA uh, is dive, driving sort of a perturbation in the abiotic inorganic carbon cycle. which is um, much simply carbon removal in the ocean related to kelp or macroalgae cultivation or um, the, you know, a series of other approaches that involve biological systems. And that creates even more complexity. So food chains and nutrient cycling are, are very complex. So the downstream impact that's possible there is a bit complicated. Um, and so there's a lot of question right now in, in the biological ocean-based removal space um, in the abiotic systems that, that we work within, the concerns are, are different. Um, so with olivine, the main concern um, that exists for our solution is trace metal content. Um, so olivine has trace amounts of nickel and chromium in, in it. Um, but what we've been able to show um, is that it won't be harmful to marine life introducing olivine into new coastal areas. And the main factor that suggests it won't be harmful to marine life is the pairing between um, the slow dissolution rate of olivine. So olivine dissolves uh, um, over the course of decades. And as it dissolves, it generates this carbon removal reaction. Um, but olivine dissolves again over the course of decades. And it's dissolving into a reservoir the size of the ocean. And so when you do the math there, you really just, you don't move the needle on nickel concentrations uh, or really anything in, in the water column, uh, which is actually why we need such sensitive instru instrumentation uh, to measure our carbon removal, because um, we, we, it's important uh, that we are able to measure. And because of the low, the low um, amounts of changes in this very large reservoir, the low and slow changes in this large reservoir, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very uh, difficult to measure measure changes, there's just there's just not much that happens. And so that coupled with the fact that coastal systems 
have a very short residence time. You know, water moves very quickly in this huge system and a very small amount of sand dissolves over decades. Um, it just doesn't move the needle on things like nickel um, and chromium. And so prior to doing our field deployments last year, we did a lot of lab-based research. Um, we did a variety of ecotoxicology tests on EPA model organisms um, following United States EPA protocols on everything from diatoms, these things at the base of the food chain, all the way up to, to fish and looking at things like growth, fertilization, mortality. Um, and then we did our field deployment. Um, and received, you know, we're able to execute two field deployments in the United States, and we now have field data and an experiment um, where we've we've placed oysters very sensitive um, organs in, in trace metal concentrations. So um, we're feeling incredibly positive about, about the, the effects here. Um, and based on you know models of, of doing this at larger scale, again, um, there's there's it's hard to be concerned about negative impacts related to trace metals with our approach. Um, we are still taking it very seriously and we we plan our sites um, with incremental levels of scale to be able to measure at each level. But at this point, we're feeling um, quite confident about that. Um, and then again, with every every different solution has different different concerns. Um, some of the other ocean alkalinity enhancement approaches are doing direct injection of alkalinity, which can cause an alkalinity spike and can also cause some other effects, um, but it's a bit distinct from from what we do. Got it. Great. So um, we'd love to understand uh, more about what it would take for implementing these technologies at scale. Um, what kind of cost structures one should expect? And in addition to costs, uh, what would you see as other bottlenecks uh, when it would come to scaling these technologies for large, uh, large scale impact? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in terms of cost, the cost ranges pretty widely, depending on if it's a Tech, a more technological or industrial approach or a nature-based approach, right? So um, talking about for afforestation, reforestation, these, these solutions can be ten, in the tens of dollars per ton. And then getting up to direct air capture, we're talking about thousands of dollars per ton. Um, so it really depends on the kind of infrastructure that's, that's needed. Um, I think that many solutions uh, that are more technologically based you know, they, they have these very ambitious targets for getting into the, you know, 150 to $300 per ton range of, of carbon removal. Um, and I think the, the one thing to note there is that those numbers are based on quite a bit of technological advancement um, and additional research and development cost. Um, so right now, I think much of the industry is, is targeting towards an eventual carbon price of settling out somewhere around $100 per ton. Um, and so many folks are trying to get to that, that point. Um, again, what's exciting about Vesta's technology is that it can get to $21, about $21 per ton. And that number is not based on massive technological leaps or improvements. That number is based on largely the efficiencies that are already embed embedded into the supply chain. So because we work with, with existing industries, mining, grinding, shipping, transportation deployment industries, you know, we as humans have been moving bulk commodities around the globe for you know, more than 100 years. So we know how to do that and we know how to do that pretty efficiently. Um, so for us, that's, that's really one of the benefits that we lean into um, is the cost effectiveness at scale. Um, we think that that, will, that that there's really a, a case to be made that in the carbon markets um, where you know carbon dioxide removal is procured, uh, the the solution that provides the lowest cost approach to permanent removal will, will really um, do well in this market, uh, and so that's kind of one of our main goals is to be able to provide that lowest cost permanent removal solution. Great. And what kind of uh, go-to-market strategies and business models are you seeing emerge in the carbon capture space? Uh, who is going to pay for it? Uh, you know, who are the different stakeholders that are going to be uh, involved? Yeah, so um, right now, there's a, the, the majority of carbon removal companies uh, base at least some part of their business, if not all, on um, selling carbon credits. So there's the voluntary carbon market where corporations uh, and individuals, but mainly corporations, are voluntarily choosing to purchase carbon removal to offset their emissions 
um, and whether it's for their own internal climate goals or what have you. Um, this market is a wildly growing market. Um, it was more than, you know, it was, um, it, it was, uh, inc it's increased more than 60% year over year for the last couple of years. Um, so we're seeing a lot of growth in the voluntary car market last year, um, Frontier, which was a coalition between a number of large buyers, including Meta, McKinsey, um, <clears throat> Alphabet, uh, Shopify, Stripe, they all came together, a few others, they came together and they committed nearly a billion dollars to pre-purchase agreements for um, new sort of more frontier solutions in the carbon removal already and um, a lot of new new solutions are, are selling into the voluntary market and then of course there's the compliance market where governments um, and international uh, groups mandate that polluting companies um, offset their emissions by by procuring carbon offsets and so um, that's really the main business model that we're going after and that many companies are going after some companies have additional revenue streams related to value-added products they create. So there's the creation of concrete, for example, with some carbon removal companies. Um, some direct air capture companies are working on th things like um, um, uh, sustainable aviation fuel. So creating synthetic fuels out of captured carbon. Um, other, you know, uh, other carbon-based products as well. So plastics and things like that. Um, so there's there's a series of approaches that, that you can take, um, but the core of them are usually um, selling into the carbon market, which again, a lot of people are uh, targeting to settle out around $100 per ton. Today, that's that's not the price of carbon. That's, that's largely being traded. Um, the EU ETS, which is one of the largest emissions trading schemes, um, did, did hit, uh, you know, $100 per ton this year um, of, of carbon traded, but uh, broadly across the globe, there's there's really, a, um, there's a much lower price um, being traded because of uh, the lack of differentiation between emissions reductions credits um, and uh, carbon avoidance credits. So that's something that's still being sort of shaken out in the in the industry. Right. And uh, given that this is a nature-based solution, how are you looking at uh, measuring the quantum of carbon uh, removed and you know, consequently uh, using that to sell the credits and price the credits? Yeah. Um, so for ocean, for ocean alkalinity, but ultimately what we do is we measure changes in seawater chemistry in the field. Um, and, and so again, this inorganic carbon pathway is very well understood by scientists in the field. Um, what we, what we, we do is we take um, in ocean uh, measurements. So we measure things like changes in alkalinity, dissolved in organic carbon, pH, um, and we measure that directly in the water column. Um, and we've demonstrated now in, in our field trials that we can measure the alkalinity generation resulting from our treatment in the field. And we've also identified some other proxies for it as well. So there's multiple ways that we can document carbon removal in the field. We take those measurements and then um, we've built models uh, that, so some proprietary models and then um, some models that are publicly accessible. We plug these measurements into these models that allow us to model things like solution rate that allows us to model how the sediment moves in the ocean and takes in other takes in other components as well that help us to understand the the full effects of the carbon removal so tides wave action ocean currents uh, ph water temperature um, and we ultimately use our our sort of software based Uh, method here to get a good set of it is not too dissimilar from other nature-based forms of removal. So it's in-field measurements that are plugged into models that give you a, um, a larger understanding of this sort of spatial and temporal scale of carbon removal. Got it. And we alluded earlier to stakeholder uh, management as well, uh, right? And uh, we at Avana often quote our own spin on a local saying around how it will take a village uh, in this case to solve for climate. Um, deploying such solutions is going to require engagements, partnerships between various kinds of stakeholders, governments, uh, civil society, techies, uh, capital allocators, enterprises. 
how does Vesta look at approaching uh, multi-stakeholder management here? Yeah, so as, as you said, um, you know, it's going to take it's going to take a lot of stakeholders to bring this to bear. Um, so if, if any technology is going to get to a billion tons of removal a year and get us towards our climate goals where we're removing anywhere from five to 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year, um, it's going to it's going to take a lot of different um, industry participants, um, government stakeholders, local communities, um, and no one can be left out of this conversation if if we are talking about really getting to scale. Um, so the stakeholder engagement landscape looks very different in different in different countries. Um, you know, starting in the U.S., we we engage at kind of every level um, of the from the the local to the to the um, to the state to the national level, um, and so we you know get permits at all of those levels. Um, we do a lot of local stakeholder engagement with the communities that live where where we're working. Um, and then in other countries, that looks that looks slightly different, um, uh, depending on the the sort of permitting structure and uh, the ways that that these technologies are regulated. Um, so for us, you know, that's that's sort of on the like policy side of things, um, or on the permitting side of things. On the policy side of things, it's going to take large scale international coordination um, to appropriately regulate these different technologies and ensure that they're able to move towards adoption in a timely but um, in a timely but careful and rigorous manner, right? Um, and so I think a lot we need a lot more intergovernmental support and funding for carbon dioxide removal technologies. Um, and that support is, is again, going to mean international frameworks for, for doing this that are, are supportive and clear um, because CDR technologies are really um, in a very nascent and pioneering space right now. Um, so there's there's that. And then I think the last thing to mention is um, community engagement, which is something that we think about a lot at Vesta. Um, we do, we really believe that in order for climate solutions to really scale, both climate and community has to win. And while we've started doing coastal carbon capture in the United States, um, coastal carbon capture is most effective in places where waters are warmer and wave energy is high. And we also really want to like, uh, cite our, our projects that are more proximate to the mine sources. And all of these things um, lead us to, to know that coastal carbon capture will likely work best in the global south. And so we didn't want community engagement to be an afterthought for us. Um, so we spent about a year and a half doing a following a participatory governance approach uh, where we learned about um, rural small island um, communities in the Dominican Republic, and we worked with them there and uh, to understand their perceptions around carbon dioxide removal um, and published a, a report on um, localized governance and perceptions of CDR in, in, um, in the developing world. And uh, also did a workshop with them where we worked to understand their needs and desires and then directed some of the proceeds of our work for use by the communities themselves to um, fund workshops so that they could build new small textile businesses. And this is sort of one example of, of, of what we're embedding into our DNA from an early, from an early moment to ensure that Coastal communities' voices are heard, included, and can benefit from some of the work being done in, in carbon dioxide removal. Um, and as with all of these answers, you know, it goes without saying that each solution has, has different things that they need to do to different ways they need to engage communities. Uh, but we really do think it's important that communities are engaged from the very local level up to up to kind of the, the national and international level in order to actually enable scale. Uh. Great. Uh, one last question from me before we open the floor uh, for questions from uh, the audience. Uh, what would be your advice to founders that are uh, early in their journey building solutions for carbon capture? Yeah, I guess um, my advice would be funding is very hard. Uh, in terms of getting the kind of funding that's necessary to scale a, a carbon removal solution. And so I would advise, you know, looking at different ways to fund your research, um, like definitely invest in uh, federal grants um, and getting government funding where possible, um, spend time 
searching searching for those and applying to them anywhere that non-dilutive funding can come in is going to be really supportive to the company um, because there's so much research and development costs associated with these technologies and um, while venture capital is really helpful for scaling the business it's very expensive for doing research um, and so Vesta has done has um, actually has a hybrid or uh, structure where we, we started originally as a nonprofit and then we spun our company out of that. And today we actually maintain a relationship with a 501c3 fund um, so that uh, the rest of our foundational research, that's, that's the stuff that we're going to publish into the open source. So our ecological safety research, our um, community engagement research, the kind of work that needs to be published into um, the open source, that work can be funded by philanthropic donations. And then our, our technology that we're developing and our the real core of the commercialization strategy is what's being developed in our company. Um, and so those two, that hybrid structure has worked really well um, and has been supportive to us in ensuring that we can do the foundational research in a way that is transparent and accessible uh, while also building a business that's going to create a sustainable model for us to really bring this to scale. So I would say get creative about your financing um, and, and spend a lot of time thinking about how to bring the right kind of capital in for the stage of development that, that your technology is at. Uh, great. Uh... We have some questions uh, from folks who are listening in. Um, I'll, I'll run through them uh, one by one. Uh, what would incentivize economically a Meta or a Stripe to prioritize your solution, your emission reduction credits versus a clean stir of carbon avoidance credit at $10 per ton? Yeah, so I think um, the, there's a couple things. Um, so many of these carbon avoidance credits at $10 a ton are really not creating much climate impact anymore, right? Um, there's additionality questions, you know, you know, some of these projects would be done without the sale of, of credits associated with them. Um, and because of the scrutiny that's coming into the the climate space right now, especially around carbon offsets, many companies are moving away from purchasing these really cheap credits. Um, because when you look under the hood, again, there's not much climate impact that's happening there. And so companies are, are moving towards prioritizing real removals that are permanent and have other benefits um, associated with them. And when, when trying to prioritize removals, you very quickly see that there is a real scarcity of supply in the market. And so companies that, um, that participated in Frontier, for example, and the many other corporations that are purchasing permanent removals that are more expensive today are doing so because they want to support the development of an industry because they know that in order to meet our global climate goals and their internal climate goals, we need lar a, a larger supply of permanent removal. And so by purchasing it higher and up the scale curve, which means that in the next couple of years or decades, they will have billion, they will have, you know, millions of tons of carbon removal to buy or even billions of tons of carbon removal to buy. So these companies are really interested in, in supporting and spurring an industry. And in part, these technology or, or financial services companies are doing so because they have the margins to do it. Um, so we're not seeing we're not seeing companies that have lower margins necessarily coming in and purchasing at these high volumes. But more and more, we are seeing companies that have hard to decarbonize um, Uh, supply chains coming in and making purchase industry can exist um, and that there will be supply to purchase. Um, and it's again, in light of some of the scrutiny and the crackdowns that are coming in on, um, on the carbon markets and what's considered uh, a viable product to buy to offset your emissions. Right. Uh, I think Rohan has a, a question for you. Uh, Rohan, do you want to just unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for this. Uh, hi, Kelly. Good to be connected again. Uh, we were one of the donors from Spectrum Impact for um, their um, uh, research. Uh, Kelly, just wanted to uh, you know remind myself uh, how how are we quantifying the time period and the sort of you know knowledge um, impact uh, on a time scale basis? I mean, we discussed this earlier, but I can't quite remember. So, if you have a given sort of you know given beach and some amount of volume that you're putting out there. Uh, what's the assessment? I don't know if you covered this in the beginning, but I joined the presentation a little later. 
Sorry, so the question is, um, how, how do we measure carbon removal or what's the time scale of carbon removal? Time scale, no, so not, not how do we measure, but what's our estimate in terms of uh, over what period of time for a given, uh, you know, amount of olivine and a given surface area of beach that we've covered, are we expecting of what tons of carbon removal? Yeah, um, so the ratio for olivine to carbon removal is that um, it's just under a one to one ratio. So um, for every, we actually use cubic yards are a little easier. So every cubic yard of olivine sand removes about a ton of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and the, the rate of that removal depends on the unique project site. Um, so there are some, some um, components some sort of like things that we look to, to to speed up the carbon removal reaction. Again, that's a that's very related to temperature, salinity, wave action, um, things that we can pull the levers on, as well as grain size and project design. Um, so the grain size of the olivine. But roughly, we're talking about a decadal time scale. Um, so we're talking about the olivine fully dissolving and fully removing the, the the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere over the course of decades. So you can think about it as um, the time it would take you to grow a tree or likely less um, time than it would take you to grow a tree. But the end benefit is that the carbon is permanently removed from the atmosphere. Really? Um, right. The last thing to say about the time scale is that olivine doesn't dissolve linearly. It dissolves in half lives. So we actually get uh, the majority of of the carbon removal reaction happening in the first 50% of the project's lifetime. So, um, you know, 75% of the removal is going to happen in the first roughly 50% of, of the project's lifetime, uh, which means that it's very helpful for sort of carbon removal sales and the business model itself. Um, and it also means that we have an interesting product at the at this sort of tail end of the project's lifetime that can be used to sell us some, somewhat more of like an insurance product potentially or different ways to, to benefit from that. Um, and so, so yeah, so there's lots of levers that we pull to create the, to make the reaction more, um, more efficient. Um, and it's, it's one of our, our main areas of interest. Um, the last thing that I'll say is that, uh, you know, today I've talked about coastal carbon capture. Um, and the applications of coastal carbon capture on coastlines and marshlands. Uh, but we've also developed another application that's based on the same chemical process. And it's actually a bioreactor, um, which can use mine waste um, and mine tailings and digest these tailings for for accelerated carbon removal um, and also for valuable metals extraction. So the way that that works is um, ultimately when you go and you mine for, for valuable metals like chromium and nickel and cobalt, you have to mine, you have to drill through a lot of olivine to get there. This is actually very true um, in India where a lot of olivine is, is located. And so olivine and other alkaline minerals are often the, the waste product that are just sitting at mine sites. And so we've developed a technology that you can kind of think of as similar to a, a wastewater treatment plant, but instead of treating wastewater, you're treating waste um, mine tailings. And when uh, the microbes that we've developed are in the presence of this, are in this bioreactor, they help to dissolve the, the, the minerals. Um, and what you get there is this accelerated carbon removal reaction, which can happen even faster than what, what I've just been describing in the oceans. Um, and it also can extract those metals that are present in the minerals. So it's an interesting approach that's much earlier on the technological development side of things, but it still sits inside of the same um, school of, of chemical reactions. Thanks, that's fascinating. I didn't know about the microbes. Thank you for that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a new, new, new approach. Uh, we'll take one last question. Um, so uh, I think we touched upon this during the conversation as well. Uh, could you dive deeper into the quantification of the credits and how do you go about uh, the MRV? Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> the the way that we do MRV um, is we have hardware. Um, so that, that, that we've developed. So we use things, um, we use a series of, of different techniques to measure, uh, to measure these changes in seawater chemistry in the field. Um, so one of the techniques is um, measuring from measuring water that exists in the pore water. Uh, so we're measuring pore water, which is the water that exists between the grains of sand in the ocean. Um, and the reason we, we have taken measurements there is because 
because you uh, have a, the water moves more slowly in between the grains of sand. And so you get more of a buildup of chemical reaction products there. So it's a good place to look um, if you're looking for concentrated reaction products. Um, another way that we measure is through these, um, these things called benthic flux chambers. Um, and so benthic flux chambers are isolating a part of the water column, um, which again, allow us to sort of like putting a, a shell on a part of the water column and which that's allowing us to again, see a more um, intense buildup of chemical reaction products. So we get a good signal there. Um, and then we're also exploring a number of different ways to, to take measurements directly in the water column. Um, so right now our team is actually out at one of our upcoming field sites in North Carolina doing some methods testing on new pieces of hardware uh, that we've been developing to take direct measurements in the field. Uh, we take those measurements and then we plug them into our models. So our models are, are modeling dissolution rates over time. They're modeling um, the immense variables that exist in the, in this, in the ocean system. Um, so these are proprietary models that take in all variables from ecological variables to geomorphological variables um, to variables in the water. Um, and we, we create new, a new model for every project site based on the parameters of that site. Um, we run those models with the field data, and then those, that, that um, output is then plugged into larger regional models that, again, give us a sense of um, spatial and temporal difference and real carbon removal rates. Um, and then those models can even be plugged into Earth systems models. Um, so again, this is similar to the way that we do any nature-based um, removals measurement. Uh, because you just can't put, you can't just put a dome on a natural system and watch the carbon go in and out. You need to measure what you can measure and then use models to best approximate um, the removals happening over time. It's what we do in forestry as well, um, taking you know, direct measurements or using satellite imagery or LIDAR and then plugging that into models. Um, so that's, that's, that's how we do it. Great. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of today's uh, conversation. Uh, thanks, Kelly, for uh, taking time and for uh, sharing your fascinating story and what Vesta is building uh, with all of us here. Uh, lovely. Uh, yeah, today. thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just going to throw our website in the earth in the uh, chat there if anybody wants to visit our website um, or feel free to send me an email my name uh, my email is just kelly at vesta.earth um would love to speak with anyone uh we yeah we're we're very happy to share about our work today okay. thanks again um have a good thanks. evening day whatever different people are that's bye for now <laughs>